Okay, I'm going to start a couple minutes early because our next speaker uh, has a lot of information to uh, present. I'm going to introduce Dr. Tim McCoy. He's a uh, curator of the Meteorite Collection at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. And uh, Tim and I began uh, working together, uh, that has been two, three years ago, um, on, a, on a grant that he's going to talk a little bit more about. But it has to do with begin, beginning to look at the use of our language and culture in science teaching. Our ancestors had their own form of science, their own form of knowledge, whether it be geographical or ecological, and we felt very, uh, we felt it was very important that in our educational effort that we began to uh, give credence and prominence uh, to our ancestral knowledge when it comes to their uh, knowledge of the world. And so I'd like to welcome Dr. Tim McCoy. <laughs> Aya Ashimangi Nehe Ewe Melakakoki, Tepewe Ishitehiani, Waha Epiani, Nungi Kakikwe, Tim McCoy Wainzuiani, Nila Miyamiya. Greetings to the council and my relatives. I'm glad to be here today. My name is Tim McCoy and I am a Miami. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about today about a project that we've been working on for the last two years. We brought together a group including Julie Olds from the tribal headquarters, Daryl Baldwin from the Miamia Project, myself from the Smithsonian Institution, and Scott, I'm sorry, and Scott Dowdrick here. He's a Mars payload engineer from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory to try to look at introducing concepts in Ashikiwi Nehikishkwi, the earth and sky, to our tribal youth. We also have collaborators from the University of Wisconsin at Green Bay who work extensively with the College of the Menominee. And in trying to do this, in trying to introduce geology and astronomy in a cultural context, we really had to wrestle with a number of issues and a number of ways of doing this. We came to two important conclusions early on, that our tribe is inexorably linked to the land on which we exist. And to do any sort of outreach, we have to do it through the lens of that land. And that our words and stories record that knowledge of our land, and they were essential. But we've had to wrestle with something far more fundamental. And that was the, the idea of Nepoyoni, knowledge, within this general sphere of human knowledge. And we are a member of the human family. How do we introduce knowledge? How do we teach our children knowledge? How do we allow them to gain knowledge on their own? And how do we let them pass that knowledge back to us when they become masters of things we have yet to master? Well, if we want to really have Miamia education, as opposed to just educating Miami kids, we should be looking at this through the lens of our culture. Our culture should be foundational in what we do. And yet, within this giant circle of Nepoyoni, culture doesn't necessarily encompass everything. And one of the fields that is really hard to wrestle with is science. Science is something that you can get in long debates. I have friends who are scientists who say science should only be done in the complete absence of culture. And I know people in culture who say science has no place. And so what I want to look at today in part is what is the proper role of science in a culturally relevant curriculum? Well, in the spirit of you wouldn't take diet advice from a 600 pound man, I don't think you should listen to advice on science and culture from someone who doesn't know anything or have any opinions about either one. And since I'm perhaps not as well known as some people in this community, I want to tell you a little bit about my background in science and culture and my views. And these views are personal. You may or may not share them, and that's OK. As a scientist, I've been doing this for about 25 years, since I was 18 years old, working on geology, meteorites, and planets. I got a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in the field of geology. In the process, I got a minor, oh, sorry. I got a minor in physics, so I've done both what people would call hard science and soft science. I spent two years working at NASA's Johnson Space Center on a postdoctoral fellowship. I've been at the Smithsonian Institution for 11 years, and I'm now the curator of meteorites there. I've written something like 75 peer-reviewed papers, but I sort of lost count a while back. And while most people in the community know me as the Mars guy, I'm actually far better known in my community for looking at the melting of asteroids, those bodies that orbit the sun between Mars and Jupiter, in the very early history of the solar system, four and a half billion years ago. And I've worked on a number of unmanned spacecraft missions to asteroids, to Mars, and to Mercury. But that doesn't really answer the question of what is science. Well, I think before you can ask the question of what is science, you have to ask what isn't science. Science isn't truth. 
there may be elements of truth. Things may become truth. I mean, there are scientific principles like gravity that we now accept as truth. But science works in its own set of paradigms and models that can change over time. It isn't answers in a book. We've all had lousy science teachers, and we've all walked away thinking that science is something that's in a book, and we just have to know it. That's not what it is at all. And science, importantly, isn't trying to sell you anything. My personal favorite is when you say weight loss products are scientifically proven. That's a method to see if they work, but we're scientists. We don't care if you're fat, you know. Uh, that's not what we're about. <laughs> there are applied scientists, like petroleum geologists, who clearly have a profit motive. And it's important to know that sometimes funding agencies, even for science, have an agenda, and you have to keep that in mind. And exploitation, even with the best motives of scientific discovery, exploitation often follows that. So what is science? Well, there are a couple of definitions you can pull off the web. This first one's a non-starter for me because it says things like knowledge or general truth. It's not truth. I actually like the second one, that science is the investigation of natural phenomenon. It involves a number of things. Observation, the scientific method you hear a lot about, which is really the careful observation of natural phenomenon. And importantly in science, we can confirm or modify any hypothesis. Our ideas change and evolve constantly. And so science is really a way of understanding the world. Now what's my view of culture? Well, I believe that you're born Miami, and I'll tell you why that's important. I'm a descendant of the Harris family line, and in Bert Anson's book uh, on the Miamis, I think we were called one of the repudiated families, so you can take that however you want. And my family moved to Kansas in about 1869. That's an interesting date if you want to talk about that later. And my father grew up in, in the old reserves land in Miami County, Kansas, but we sort of made the counter-migration, and I was actually raised in East Central Illinois, a little bit south of Champaign-Urbana. And when I was a kid, you know, we had an awareness of Miami, Miami heritage, but no contact with the tribe. And I didn't join the tribe until late 2000, when many Miami, uh, Kansas Miamis were eligible to join. But as much as you're born Miami, I think you become Miami. And I became interested in outreach to the tribe in about 2005. I first contacted Daryl. I think he thought I was some crazy guy that kept sending me emails. And then Julie Olds. And I received NASA funding. We've gotten grants for three years, a total of about $45,000 to support this work. And I made my first trips to Miami University in Oklahoma in 2006. And in many ways, I had a cultural awakening when I was 42 years old. But I think I am typical of many of the distended members of the tribe. You know, there's an awareness of our heritage, but not a contact with it. That's changed a lot since my sons were born. They're six and eight years old. And I've been working on learning Miamia with them, with an emphasis on stories and the kind of morning and evening phrases that we can share every day. And I'm a firm believer that culture is what you practice every day and incorporate into your life. Ceremony is important, but culture is who we are. And it is our culture. It's not our ancestors' culture. And I see culture as a way of understanding our world. And so really, I think science and culture have an, an overlap, not complete, but an overlap, in that they're both ways of understanding the natural world. Now when I say something like that, you probably think I'm going to talk about traditional ecological knowledge. But I'm not. I'm not even the most qualified person in this room to talk about that. What I want to do is talk about Mion Miongi, the place of the Miami. And I want to take you on a journey of my, through Miami from its origins into its future. And look at how modern science like geology and astronomy intersect, expand, and complement traditional cultural knowledge of Miami This is what most people, if I say Miami particularly traditional Miami this is what a lot of people would have in their head, you know, Illinois, Indiana, parts of Ohio, slightly up into Michigan, parts of Wisconsin. But where did Miyongi come from? Well, what is the origin of our land? Well, traditionally in Algonquian lineage tribes, we have earth diver stories. And earth diver stories are far too complex to, to encapsulate on one slide, but I'll try the best I can. There are general themes. The land, the animals, and the peoples were formed. And Wisakachakwa was the caretaker of those. He was ordered to keep harmony among the beings. But the creatures of the earth fought and quarreled and as a consequence, land was flooded. It may sound familiar to another story you've heard. Three animals survived, one otter, one beaver, and one muskrat. And Wisakachakwa survived, but did not have the power to create land. He could only spread land. 
And so he challenged each of these animals to dive for the old earth, knowing that if they could bring up a piece of the old earth, he could spread that to make the land. In the Miami version, which has largely been lost, otter was the animal that was successful. And Wissakachakwa was able to take a bit of old earth that otter brought up from the seafloor and spread it to form new land. Well, is there any complementary part of that to modern science? Well, let's take a place like Ohio. This is a, a modern geologic view of Ohio. And if you just strip off all the dirt and you look at the rocks, the rocks in Ohio, from where we're standing, are a group of rocks we would call Ordovician. And if you go to the east, they become progressively younger to rocks called Permian, ranging from about 450 million years old to about 250 million years old. And they become younger because the land underneath Ohio, the rocks, like a deck of cards, have been arched up and planed off. You thought only St. Louis had an arch, but actually the Cincinnati arch is extremely well known in geologic circles. <laughs> And so as you move to the east, you become progressively younger. Well, how did these rocks actually form? Well, you can do something called a paleocontinent reconstruction. This is a little intimidating, but don't let it scare you too much. All you need to know is that the green and white parts are land, and the blue is water. And I think you can just make out the outline of North America here. And the red star is where we are today. You'll notice that North America 460 million years ago, in that time period called the Ordovician, was at the equator. And where we stand today was underwater, in a shallow sea. So the land literally emerged from the water. And how do we know that? Well, you probably recognize this. A geologist would call this an inarticulate brachiopod, inarticulate reflecting the way the shell opens. We had no personal knowledge of its public speaking skills. Um, <laughs> but any reasonable person would call this a seashell. <laughs> but this isn't just any seashell because it's not a modern seashell. It's a fossil seashell. It's from uh, about 60 miles south here, the Great Falls of the Ohio. And this is limestone. This is a fossilized rock. You find this on land, and yet it obviously formed, it came out of the water. And the fact that it is limestone, wapasena, is kind of interesting because wapasena, a word that has animacy. How do you establish animacy in something like a rock? Well, you do if that rock was once alive. And so we see this intersection. And our land became a legacy in our stories. And so let me start with our creation story, our, our origin story. And it's excerpted here, and I've written in both English and, and Miami. I'm not so bold as to think I'm going to read the Miami version. But at first, the Miami came out of the water. From there, they went away. After a while, one returned. When he came back, he saw the other Indians. He named them Old Moccasins. Matok and Asinakana, the Old Moccasins. So there's a recognition, even in our origin story, that there were people on our land before we were here. And did they have a relationship with the earth and the sky? Well, you can go back to the Hopewell culture. These are actually the Hopewell mounds here in Ohio um, from about 2,000 years ago. And excavations have turned up the, oh, sorry, have turned up these. These are beads made of metal. And that metal is, is an iron meteorite, a piece of the sky that fell to Earth. So our ancestors, the people that lived on Miyamiyongi before our tribe even came into this land, collected things from the sky and made these objects out of them. If you move forward about 1,000 years to the Fort Ancient culture, the iconic serpent mound, probably the oldest representation of a serpent preserved in Miyamiyongi, it's about 1,500 feet long, it's about three feet high, very well known. What's less well known is that if you go there, that this serpent mound is actually built inside of an impact crater. Highly eroded, 280 million year old, five mile diameter crater. Something like 300 million years ago, an object about a half a mile across came crushing through the atmosphere and left this giant hole. And a thousand years ago, this was built inside there. And you can prove that. Because if you go to uh, the Serpent Mound impact structure, this is Daryl, you can collect funny looking rocks like these. See these little cone shapes? These are called shatter cones. They're for caused when shockwave passes through the rock and they reach some point and expand rapidly, creating these shock cones. They are diagnostic of impact. So a thousand years ago, the ancestors on our land built this mound inside of something formed from the sky. And that may carry through into our modern stories. 
This is Elena Pinge's story. And again, I'm going to read excerpts from it. Captain Brulé used to tell about a deep spot in the Mississinawa River. The Indians call it stone cliffs facing each other. A Manitou lived there, they say. They call him Lenapinja. Whenever a star would change its place, the Indians would say, Lenapinja is coming. Well, the Miamia version of Lenapinja is Lenapingia. So let's look a little bit about Lenapingia. Lenapingia is viewed a number of ways. The water serpent, the whale, the underwater panther that David talked about. And Lenapinji is a, an icon that goes back into Hopewell times. It's also viewed as a, a horned serpent. This is one representation of a horned serpent that I pulled off the web. Here a deer antler serving of the horn. But an interesting fact is that Lenapinji is the personified form of the word Alangwahanisata for meteor or comet. And so Lenapingia is a meteor or a comet. This is the Peekskill meteor. It fell in 1992. And you can see the similarity between something like the Hale-Bopp comet. Comets have these two very distinctive tails. One's made of particles and the other made of ions, charged particles. And you can see, you could imagine this is a horn and that's a tail of a serpent. But Lenapingia stories come with a number of other features to them. In particular, it's often viewed as a fiery body, body seen to fall into water. And it's accompanied by whirlwinds. Now, when you hear this, you think, is this just a fanciful retelling? I mean, is this an exaggeration, if you will, uh, in, the, in the realm of myth that we hear so often used to describe what we call stories? Well, maybe not. Let me take you to a late June morning in 1908 on the taiga, the, the vast plains of Siberia. On that day, at about 7.45 in the morning, an object tens of meters across came into the atmosphere and burst about five miles above the surface of the Earth. It set off seismographs around the world, and there was a distinct glow in the night sky for a few days afterwards. But those of you that know your world history, 1908 was kind of a bad year for the Russians. They were undergoing the Russian Revolution. It would be 15 years before they would actually go to the Tunguska region. And when they went there, they found both the most remarkable occurrences and stories. This is a first-hand account from someone who witnesses. We had a, a hut by the river with my brother. There was noise beyond the hut. We could hear trees falling down. The earth began to move and rock. Wind hit our hut and knocked it over. My body was pushed down by sticks but my head was in the clear. Trees were falling, the branches were on fire, it became mighty bright. And the physical evidence of this were trees that were flattened. This is probably the iconic photograph of Tunguska taken by the 1923 Kulik expedition. These trees that were flattened for literally miles around by the force of this blast in the atmosphere. And yet, no crater was made. So if you go to this spot 500 years from now, a forest will grow, and there will be no evidence that anything ever happened. And yet, these first-hand accounts sound remarkably like what we hear in the Lenapingia stories. And events like this probably happen on timescales of hundreds or thousands of years. So it's entirely possible that something like this happened over the North American continent within the times remembered by either our ancestors or the Matakasin Akana, the old moccasins. So while those were the events that perhaps formed and influenced our, our lives and our story, our land and our story, we are, we are, not our answers, we are a people of cycles. Cycles of the day, the month, the seasons, and the years. And those cycles are, are recorded by, are controlled by just three bodies, the earth, the sun, and the moon. And they are encapsulated in our words. And so if we take a word like nawaseke, Let's look at Nawaseke for a minute. And we'll look at this by looking at one of our stories. This is a Why We Have Daylight. You've probably seen this as a familiar Algonquian story. I've checked it out from the library with my sons. There's a version, uh, How Chipmunk Got His Stripes. This version happens to be How Rabbits Got Hair Lipped. Um, but let me read a little bit. I'm going to have to read from over here. I can't quite make that screen out. These are some uh, chalk on uh, black construction paper drawings that I did with my sons. They're of the age that they really like picture stories. One night, Rabbit and Bear were quarreling with each other. Bear wanted it always to be dark. Rabbit wanted it always to be light. So they decided to make a little bet, and they sat up all night. Bear said, let it be dark, let it be dark, let it be dark. Rabbit said, let it be light, let it be light, let it be light. OK, now, I see a little girl sitting here in the front. And do you think it became light? What do you think? Who thinks it became light? Let's see some hands. Come on, we're interactive here. Come on. Anyone think it didn't become light? Okay, well, of course it became light. After a while, it became light. 
But we knew it was going to become light. Why? Because of Nawa Seke, that time before the sun comes over the horizon in which the light is starting to influence, the, the animals are starting to wake up. But Nawa Seke is a concept we worry about in modern astronomy. This is the infrared telescope facility. It's, I don't know, $300 million facility up on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. I spent a few nights there observing asteroids. And in astronomy, we call Nawaseki astronomical dawn, the time at which light from the sun is starting to scatter into the atmosphere. And it's a very important concept because this is an unusual picture where the dome is actually open. Normally, the dome is closed at Nawaseki because otherwise you get so much light into these very large, very sensitive telescopes that you can flood them and ruin the detectors. And so a concept that is thousands of years old, this Nawaseki, is a concept we worry about in astronomy. Well, what about the next stage, the month, the phases of the moon, which record our time? And you know, the waxing and waning moon, which records this period. And there's interesting language associated with this. For example, over here you can see Sakiwa, he sprouts. The moon is literally growing like a plant. Or the alternative, as the, the moon is waning, Niyashineta, he is dying there. The moon is literally disappearing. Now, as a modern person trained in astronomy, it's, it's very difficult for me to wrap my brain around this, and I, I need audiovisual aids. And so there's actually a great one in this uh, Wasaka Chalk story, this Cree story, Wasaka Chalk flies to the moon. And this was just a fabulous illustration that I came across. The moon was shrinking, and his seat was becoming sharper and sharper until at last he had to hold on to the horns of the moon. And so the concept that the moon literally disappeared in the night sky as it waned well, of course, we know that the moon doesn't really disappear. It's controlled again by these three bodies, the earth, the moon, and the sun. So if the sun is over here off to the side, over here for those of you here, or it could still be over here for those of you that are over here. Um, <laughs> and the, the, the earth, of course, rotates on its axis every 24 hours. The moon moves around the earth every 29 days. But all you're doing when you see the phases of the moon is that you're seeing what time of day and where the moon is. So in a new moon, there's still a lit side of the moon. It's just facing away from the Earth, and you'd be looking at it at noon. The full moon is opposite the Earth. You're seeing the entire lighted hemisphere of the moon, and um, you see it around midnight. Now, one of the interesting things that you'll notice in this, there's two things that's interesting about this, one of which is this, the moon is tidally locked. It moves around. We always see the same face of it. But there is no dark side of the moon, despite the Pink Floyd album cover that's become <laughs> iconic. There is no dark side of the moon. The same part, the moons get the same amount of light all over. It just depends on what you see. But you'll notice that here you can sort of make out that there's a, a, a dark side of the moon, right? It's not quite all the way hidden. And yet, when you look at the moon, the moon is remarkably stark when you look at it in the night sky. And if you go back and you look at Apollo images, Take a look at a rock with a shadow. There is nothing in that shadow. You can see nothing. And the reason is Nawaseke. On the moon, there is no Nawaseke because there is no atmosphere to scatter the light. The sun is up, the sun is down. There is no in-between. A shadow is completely and utterly black. And so that's why you can't see any of the dark portion of the moon during the month. Well, what about a word like Mayaqueche? Mayaqueche is an interesting word. It, it means south. And you've probably heard Mayaqueta, noon. Well, why would we think, why would we associate noon and south? It's probably obvious to some of you, but probably not if you were doing an education of your kids. The reason is because, of course, the Earth is tilted relative to its rotation around the sun. The axis is tilted by about 29 degrees. And so as it moves around, for example, in the northern hemisphere winter, the axis is tilted away from the sun, the incoming sunlight is spread over a large portion of the surface, and you end up getting cold, winter. But you can define two lines on the surface of the Earth, the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. And those are offset from the equator by the same angle at which the axis is tilted to the sun. The reason that's important is because in the winter, if you're north of the Tropic of Cancer, of course, you're looking down, you're looking to the south to see the sun. But in the summer, 
the sun would be direct, at the, at the height of summer, the summer solstice, the sun would be directly overhead of the Tropic of Cancer. But if you're in the northern, north of the Tropic of Cancer, again, you're looking down. You're looking south at the sun. And of course, much sunlight hits a smaller space, and so it's warm, it's summer. And you can show this, that if you live north of the Tropic of Cancer, the sun will always be in the south at noon. You can prove this to yourself. You can go out and take a picture. This picture was taken over 52 weeks at the same time of day once a week. And the sun defines this interesting figure eight pattern because, of course, the orbit of the Earth around the sun is an ellipse, not a circle. That's why you get the figure eight. The midwinter is the lowest point here. The midsummer is the highest point. This happens to be the Parthenon in Athens, Greece. But because we live north of the Tropic of Cancer, Maya Kwechi, the sun is always in the south. So that word records both an astronomical and a geographical knowledge of our people. If we were Polynesians, we could not use the word Maya Kwechi to describe south because the sun would not always be in the south. Sometimes it would be overhead or even to the north. I know, I lived in Hawaii. Sometimes words can record change as well as cycles. So for example, an interesting word is Wakuya. Wakuya. Wakuya is one of our months. It's the whippoorwill moon. The Wakuya is the whippoorwill. So here we have a cycle, the lunar cycle, which there's a lovely poster over here on the wall that you should take a look at. But whippoorwills aren't particularly common anymore because of forest fragmentation, because of human change. And so that word is actually changing since our ancestors. But sometimes a word can record both change and cycles. This was probably the most interesting word Daryl ever told me, Unsawiaki. And to explain Unsawiaki, I'm going to have to take you to the two hottest places in our solar system, the center of our Earth and the surface of the sun. If you take the Earth and you peel it apart like an onion shell, in the middle you'll find a big ball of iron nickel metal, basically a giant iron meteorite. Part of it is liquid and part of it is solid, and it spins. Okay. Well, a spinning molten metal creates an electrical field, which creates a magnetic field. And that magnetic field of the Earth, those magnetic field lines, are what control compasses. And so that's why we have a north and south magnetic field, because of that hot ball of molten metal in the center of our planet. Well, if you go look at the sun, please don't go look at the sun, OK? That's a bad idea. But if you take a fancy telescope and go look at the sun, you'll see these dark spots on there, sun spots, OK? Sunspots are there. They're, they're basically solar storms. And they peak. If you just take and you put a plot of the number of sunspots, very simple plot, number of sunspots versus year, and you just count them. You see it goes up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. But it does it very, very regularly. The sun has its own cycle, an 11-year solar cycle caused by the convections deep inside the sun. And when it has these solar cycles, at the peak, at what we call the solar maximum, not only do we see more sunspots, we see more solar storms. And those solar storms have an interesting consequence. During a solar storm, the sun essentially belches out charged particles. Those charged particles oh, sorry, come streaming towards the Earth, and they interact with the Earth. But you notice they don't come in right at the equator. They're bent around because they are charged particles. They follow the magnetic field lines. They come in at the North and South Pole, and they create Unsawiaki. But the reason Unsawiaki was such an interesting word to me is if I worked for the uh, Indiana Tourism Board, I wouldn't say, hey, come to Indiana, see the northern lights. You know, you usually go to Alaska to see the northern lights. So how did we come up with the word Unsawiaki? Well, we shouldn't be so naive as to think our ancestors didn't travel. My personal favorite, I always say to my kids at bedtime, ne yolana kate kiko nunguya, see you later alligator. And so there were words for alligators. But where did they come up with Unsawiaki? Well, I think it's an interesting word because, remember, Unsawiaki is created by the magnetic poles. But the magnetic pole and the geographic pole don't align. This is, right here would be the North Geographic Pole. And this is a path of the North Magnetic Pole, some sort of drunken sailor wandering around the North Pole. But let me put this another way. So this is a familiar map of North America with that same map. And what you'll notice is that between 1800 and 1900, the North Magnetic Pole was much closer to Miami than it is today. And as a consequence, you would have had many more northern lights, many more Unsawiaki. In fact, the North Pole, the North Magnetic Pole, is moving rapidly away from America right now. It'll probably be in Siberia by 2050. 
And so that word, created by the cycles of the sun and the earth, they peak every 11 years, but they change with time, and that word records that change. Well, we've seen how the earth, how Miyamiyongi has changed since its formation, and how it changes on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. But it continues to change, and more importantly, our concept of it is evolving. We have an evolving concept of Miyamiyongi. Because we are not a people that are static. We are people that explore. I explore. I explore off this earth. And one of the places I like to explore is Mars. I spend about a day a week, or a month a week, I'm sorry, a week a month, one week a month, working on Mars. It's fun work that commutes hell. But, um, <laughs> you know, so I work on Mars. And, oh, sorry, Mars now has a name. Nepikalangwa, literally the red star. Now we know Mars isn't really a star, but it's a great word because it follows Michelangwa, the morning or the morning or evening star that you've heard of, which is Venus. And so we follow the same nomenclature for Mars that we did for Venus. And the tool that I like to, to drive around, and I do this one week a month, I drive around this rover. There's not many traffic jams on Mars, so it's kind of fun. And this is our Mars rover. It's, oh shoot, sorry, I keep having problems with the buttons here. It's a solar powered spacecraft, unmanned. This is the, the PanCam mast assembly. It's about as tall as you are. If you were standing next to it, it pretty much looks you in the eye. It's got a little arm that reaches out in front of you here. And it now has a name, Nepikalangwa Keosia. Nepikalangwa Keosia. It's a great name. And it was developed by the tribe students here at Miami University. It's literally Mars Wanderer, because that's what it does. It wanders. It's an extension of us, and it sends back that information, much like a wanderer from our tribe would go out and collect information and bring it back to us. This goes out to Mars and collects that information. And it's really interesting, because they went through a variety of different uh, terms to try to come up with this. Someone suggested, apparently, one of the, those in the running was Sunning Goose which is interesting because it's a solar-powered spacecraft and this long neck is somewhat goose-like. and That would have followed the model apparently that was used for a car which has some similarities to a turtle. But uh, I think it's a great name because it doesn't just describe what it is, it describes what it does, which is one of the key features of our language. But our language is changing because places that would have been exotic, no, not exotic, unthought of to our ancestors are becoming familiar to us. This is the Miami rock sitting on Mars. This is a, a red, green, blue, if you just use three filters. This is what it actually looked like. It would look like a red rock, which is pretty much what every Mar rock on Mars looks like. But this rock is becoming familiar to us. To me, this rock is more familiar than any rock in Oklahoma, I can tell you that. Probably any rock in Indiana. And people are becoming familiar with this. And I think as we do this, we challenge ourselves to let our language change, to develop new words. And whose job is that? Well, I will argue that it's not my job, or Daryl's job, or David's job, or our elders, or even our chief. It's our job of our youth. Our children and grandchildren are the ones that are going to have to decide if, first, an object has enough cultural significance to warrant a word, and then, with our help, to develop those words. And if they do that, and this happens all the time in English. I mean, I was 40 years old before I heard the word texted. And, uh, you know, that's a common word now. But if they do this, then they won't just be learning the language. They'll be building the language. And much like a mason would show off his house, I think they will show off their language because they helped to build it. And so what I hope I've convinced you today is that Miyamiyongi isn't this simple two-dimensional representation. It includes Ashkiwi, the earth, Asena, the rocks, Kishkwi, the sky, Kiswa, the moon, Nipikalangwa, Mars, Lenapingia, the comets, Shipaya Panawe, the spirit trail, the Milky Way, the place where our ancestors walked, and Kiswa, the sun. And this is not a new concept. This is an evolving concept. These were fundamental parts of our ancestors' lands, much as they are part of ours. And it's this three-dimensional view that's really important. And so if we think, go back to this issue of science and culture, I believe science and culture have an overlap. And I believe things like ashikiwi, kishikwi, words and stories, are a powerful tool for teaching this. From the very simplest concepts like, why do we have a day? 
to the most complex concepts, things like the North, how the Northern Lights form, that's a concept that most people would not learn until they were in a graduate course in geology. So how do we actually extend this? We think this is a good idea. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know. But how do we extend this? Well, I will argue that it is so important that we do this when our children are young. Read the stories to them. Read our stories. I mean, I did these drawings not because, you know, I love drawing. Gosh, I'm a lousy artist, as you can tell from this. But I did them because they help my kids connect to these stories. Read the stories from other cultures. They help us inform that. And do this when they're young because, you know what? I don't want my kids to have a cultural awakening at 42. I want this to be a part of their background. So this is the lens through which they view everything else. I have this laminated up on our refrigerator. My youngest son, we call him Makunza. This is his moon right now, Makunza Kilswa. That's a really exciting thing for him. And so, please do this. And let's try to do this as a tribe. You know, we have a library. And as much as I think we have a great library at our tribal headquarters, I would love to go in there someday unannounced and find out that they were having story time in Miami. You know, this is the kind of thing we should be doing as a tribe. And if as an adult you're interested in more about this, there are some really good books. There's a book called Native Science by Gregor Kehete. He's a Tewa. I don't agree with everything he says. He's not a practicing science, but I think he really challenges some of the paradigms under which scientists work. There's a geologist named Steve Semkin at Arizona State University. He taught for years on the, at Diné College, has worked extensively with the Diné, the Navajo, at developing place-based geoscience curriculum that are culturally relevant to them. And a book I particularly like is called Wisdom Sits in Places. It's by Keith Basso at uh, uh, New University of New Mexico. And it's a study of the Western Apache and how they associate these stories with places. For example, stone cliffs facing each other are associated with the moral story, of which most of these stories, you know, the parts I've shown you are, are minor component. They are stories about how to live life. And those places become embedded in that. And I just want to leave you with my email address, because this isn't something I'm going to do or Daryl's going to do. This is a conversation that we have to have as a community with scholars and teachers and scientists and engineers and parents and children. And I hope that I can be a part of that. And if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. And I'd be happy to take emails. I, I can never get too much email, because I get enough junk email anyway. Misha Newey.